turning points uh, in Matthew's gospel. And, and to really understand it correctly, we have to keep reminding ourselves, this is Matthew Levi, the Jewish, what should have been a priest, turned tax collector, now a disciple of Jesus, writing after the death and resurrection of Jesus to try to share the gospel so that it would make sense in terms of the identity of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, in, in the first century. Uh, so to him, I'm sure, again, we're looking after the fact, but uh, to him, this was a critical, uh, critical chapter. The other thing that's uh, taken place is that uh, because uh, he's got the Pharisees and Sadducees now in a building drama as of chapter 12, they've rejected his Messiahship nationally. Jesus says that they, that generation of those Jews, those national leaders, therefore committed the unpardonable sin. So now everything shifts in terms of his ministry. It's no longer authenticating his Messiahship. He's done doing that. We see that he still does miracles, but he does that out of compassion, whether it's for a multitude that are hungry or a couple of leopards or a Canaanite uh, woman as we looked at a couple of weeks ago. At the same time, he's kind of taking it on the road. You know, we've, we've looked at him, and I've got a, a map again I showed you a few weeks ago uh, that he was in the area of the Decapolis. So he's uh, crossed the Jordan to the uh, east side of the Jordan. Uh, and Decapolis just means the, the 10 cities, 10 Roman cities that were in that area. That's where Jesus has been uh, ministering, uh, pretty much a non-Jewish audience. Not to say that there weren't some Jews that followed him wherever he went at this point, but predominantly he's trying to stay out of Judea, out of Galilee, away from Herod and away from Herod's jurisdiction because he wants to kill him. Jesus is quite willing to die, but he's going to do it on his own terms and on the specific day uh, prophesied uh, by the Old Testament. That green area, he's going to go up in that area. Let's take a look at the next map. Again, just a reminder, he will find him in our second uh, paragraph in Caesarea Philippi at the base you can see of Mount Hermon. So pretty far away from the Galilee area. That's not to say that there aren't still crowds coming uh, to hear him. But uh, he's uh, moved out of a Jewish audience at this point. He's biding his time and pretty much is trying to pour into these 12 guys. And we're going to see uh, some of the um, discussions that go with them. And this becomes pertinent when we realize that as we start the chapter, the Pharisees and Sadducees have come to him. <laughs> They came a long ways uh, from, from Jerusalem. Uh, these are two groups of people that would not normally give each other the time of day, much less take a road trip together. But uh, uh, as they say, politics makes strange bedfellows, and, uh, and we see that with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Let's take a look at the, uh, our first point, which is Jesus will confirm his identity with one final sign. Verses 1 to 4, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. So uh, they come, uh, he is asked to confirm his identity by the Pharisees and Sadducees and with a sign from heaven. So again, uh, in, their, in their kind of uh, Jewish mythology thinking at that time, you could have signs of earth, like maybe multiplying breads, uh, bread. And, uh, and maybe possibly Satan and his power could do that as well. So they're very specific. That's the idea. Show us a sign from heaven. Show us something from above so that we can know who you really are. Well, he's done really dealing with this, these guys. 
uh, for the most part. He will continue debating them to some degree as we get into Jerusalem uh, and, can, and really confounding them in terms of his wisdom and his ability to uh, quote the scriptures and so forth. But he's really not going there. So what he does do is he rebukes them and says, listen, you're able to look around at the world and things that are going on. You're able to look at the sky. You're able to draw the facts. You're able to come to a logical conclusion. But you're unable to do that in terms of the most important things that are, that are really happening now in terms of the signs of the times, the fulfillment of Scripture. And so he calls them a wicked and adulterous generation. Wicked because they had turned away from the word of God, as we talked about last week, holding to the traditions of man, adulterous in terms of turning away from the intent in terms of a, a love relationship with God and what should be motivating their heart in terms of their worship and the study of the word of God. Because it's not that they don't study the word of God that they do, but it's for all the wrong purposes. So um, uh, again, they want his identity confirmed, but uh, there's very much of a rebuke involved here. What he will do, he says, he'll confirm his identity by one final sign, and this is not the first time he's mentioned it. Uh, we saw it uh, a few weeks ago in a previous chapter. It will be by the, the sign of Jonah. And again, the, the sign of Jonah uh, is, is death and resurrection. And uh, it's interesting, studying the book of Jonah, of course, you know, he's uh, swallowed by the, the large fish, and then, as King James says, was spewed forth on the land and goes into Nineveh, preaches the, uh, the gospel and the whole town, this uh, large city of what was one of the most wicked people that have ever lived, repent and, uh, and so forth. And the judgment of God that Jonah hoped would happen to them is put off for a generation. It does come uh, eventually. But um, some people wonder if, uh, if Jonah died uh, in the belly of the well. I think that's what Jesus is saying here. Death and resurrection. You know, sometimes, again, we miss the argument uh, or we get into the argument, was it a literal three days or not and so forth? Because he says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights, three nights in the heart of the earth. That's uh, in the parallel account in, in Luke's gospel. Uh, that's really not even an issue. It's just a Jewish idiom. And, uh, uh, you know, a part, a part of those three days. The issue is he died and rose again. That's, that's the last sign that he'll, that he'll get. I don't think Jesus is under uh, any pretense that that'll make a huge difference in these guys' lives because in Luke's gospel, he tells a story, not a parable of a story, uh, of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And of course, uh, you know the story. It, it allows us to picture Hades or the Hebrew Sheol, this temporary place of abode where there was a, a place of torment, a gulf, and then what's referred to as Abraham's bosom. Jesus refers to it on the cross to the thief there as paradise, where there's a place of comfort, a place of torment, a gulf in between. And the rich man is saying, can't you send Lazarus over here to even bring us a, a drop of water? They're conscious, they're in torment, and, uh, and so forth. And you remember the response then, well, if you can't do that, then send someone back from the grave to tell them. And, uh, and, uh, and Jesus says, then if they did not believe the Bible, if they did not believe Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, all the predictions, if they didn't believe that, they will not believe even if someone rises again from the dead although that will be the final sign. And that certainly becomes the cornerstone then of the preaching of the teaching of the apostles through the book of Acts and, and today. Uh, we place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and he authenticates everything that he said he would do by the fact that he predicted his death and he rose again uh, from the dead. And, um, and, uh, and again, uh, in terms of the miraculous power of Jesus Christ, it's only liberal university professors that deny that today. His worst critics in that day, Herod, believed it. Uh, even the, uh, the Pharisees believed it. They saw it. But uh, they had to attribute what he did by the power of uh, Beelzebub or, or Satan. So there would be one final sign in terms of his identity and it would be death and resurrection. Secondly, he cautions the disciples to be on their guard. Verse 5, when they went across the lake, 
the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you have little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand? I was not talking to you about bread, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, do you have a hard time not having a smile come to your face just reading this, this passage and these, these guys? And I think we, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, appreciate the, you know, Peter and the boys here who have a hard time getting it, you know, but I think we have to also re remind ourselves that if we were them, we would probably react the same way. There's a, there's a lot of pretty basic, simple things the Lord instructs us in that somehow we kind of have issues with and struggle with and wonder about. And, you know, and, and, and the Lord is faithful to come and not crack us over the head, but just say, don't you remember? And don't you remember? You're concerned about this? You're concerned about the future of this? Don't you remember? And uh, uh, as I've said often, I'm sure the angels in heaven get a big kick out of us, you know, in terms of, because uh, when we read about these guys, we have to realize that uh, uh, we're pretty much, uh, uh, you know, of, of the same nature and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but again, the Pharisees and Sadducees coming together here, Jesus is very concerned about their influence because they were very influential in the country. Again, the Sadducees basically ran the Sanhedrin. They were in control. They had the majority uh, equivalent to our Supreme Court, but with a, a spiritual or religious connotation. Uh, the Pharisees were there, but they were in the minority. The Sadducees were the liberals of the day. The Pharisees were the conservatives of the day. And here they are arguing together against Jesus. This would be the equivalent of taking the, uh, the Democratic National Committee and putting them together with the Republican National Committee, and, uh, and they would find something to agree on and go out and campaign together. Not likely to happen, but uh, that's the, other, the idea. These guys are uh, on the extreme and we're constantly debating and arguing with each other. And Jesus says, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then secondly, he cautions disciples because of their lack of understanding and their little faith. Little faith apparently is one of his favorite names for the disciples. He calls them that in Matthew 6, Matthew 8, Matthew 14, and here in Matthew 16. Probably not a, a good pet name to have, uh, little faith. Uh, but again, he reminds them of his provisions of the past. He reminds them of the, the miracles. Weren't you the guys that carried the basketfuls of bread away? And, and again, we, uh, I don't know if we made mention of it, but in that second set of miracles where uh, the seven uh, loaves for four thousands. The term for basket that was used is a basket that was large enough to put a person in. It's the same word that's described the basket when Paul is let down from Damascus over the wall in a basket. So these are very large baskets uh, full of bread that these guys probably hauled around with them for a little bit, but it quite uh, didn't quite sink in. Now, the only kind of uh, uh, excuse or maybe to understand their thinking a little bit is that uh, uh, they're concerned about bread, whether it has yeast or not, because there's actually no kosher delis in that part of the woods. You know, they're, they're in real, <laughs> real Gentile territory. They may have been a little concerned about what they're going to be eating and so forth. Uh, but still, what they, what they are doing is forgetting who they are with. And they're certainly forgetting his power to provide. And uh, most importantly here, they're forgetting his identity who he is in terms of the Messiah. The third thing we notice is that he cautions the disciples because of the, again, teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There have been other places, and we saw that a few weeks ago, where he deals with their hypocrisy uh, and, uh, and so forth. And he calls them uh, hypocrites here and uh, really rails against them. And uh, Luke brings out a few other words, choice words that he uses for them here. But the warning here is not just that they're, they're hypocrites, that they pretend to be something that they're not. 
the warnings against their teaching. Again, again, what was their teaching? Their teaching was taking the word of God and then determining uh, that uh, the way we'll keep the word of God is by doing this, this, and this. And they developed their oral traditions that later become the Mishnah, that later then the Talmud is a commentary on, on how to understand that, and it gets very far removed from the word of God. And uh, anytime Jesus is warning us of something, it's probably because we need to be warned. <laughs> anytime he says, do not fear, it's because they were afraid. And, uh, and this is exactly certainly what happened uh, in church history. Uh, by about the third uh, century, uh, there in Syria, um, uh, Antioch, you had uh, uh, a group of believers, church leaders that held to a, a literal view of scripture that, that we would today. Again, when we say literal, uh, we just take it at face value, how it normally would be understood. We, all, 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 we also realize that there's metaphors when it says, and Jesus is the door. We don't think he's really a door. We think that's a metaphor. Sometimes people call us wooden literalists. That's not really true. We, we, t we take it uh, at face value, just normally how you would read it, normally how you have a conversation with somebody and understand them. Uh, you know, when somebody uh, says something to you, you don't all of a sudden go, is that an allegorical statement? You're saying this, but did you really mean? Th no, we just take it at face value. That's how we take the scripture. At the same time, down in, in Egypt, in Alexandria, there was a group of leaders down there that, were, that began to look at scripture from that allegorical point of view. It says this, but I think it's really an analogy that means this. And basically, what it meant then was whatever they said that it meant. And eventually, uh, there's a young guy that uh, comes to faith and moves to that area, a guy named Augustine in about 386, who becomes the theologian of the church at that point in time, probably had the greatest influence uh, over the church than any other single person. And he adopts that allegorical view that was prevalent in that area. And eventually this one fades away in and, uh, and Roman Catholicism, then which spreads uh, their particular slant on Christianity through Western Europe, has that allegorical view. Uh, there's, there's the downfall. Jesus is saying, don't go with what adds on to the word of God, actually hold to uh, the word of God. It was certainly a valid concern. It still remains a valid concern today. There was a, a Pew um, poll that was done just uh, in February of, uh, of this year. Uh, and they, they uh, surveyed what they called evangelical Christians, and they had them define themselves as evangelical Christians by saying they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and they believe that the Bible is the word of God. So that, that narrows it down a bit from a lot of people that might call themselves Christians. Uh, it was found that more than half of evangelical respondents said that many religions can lead to eternal life. Despite the central evangelical tenet that Jesus is the sole path to eternity with God. Today, February of this year, this is a pretty broad survey across the country. Not half, over half uh, of people that call themselves evangelical Christians, not all Christians in the country that call themselves Christians, but evangelical Christians, over half deny the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. I don't know if they think he was lying or what when he said that I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, be cautious. Guard against certainly hypocrisy, uh, but he's already dealt with that. Here it's very specific. The teaching of the Pharisees and the teaching of the Pharisees is what they added on to the word of God. Not a complete denial of scripture, but what they brought into it uh, that was not based on scripture uh, it, itself. So we need to be, uh, to be very, very, very careful. I, I read a funny article about a guy from New Zealand. It was in an AP article who uh, didn't like wearing a seatbelt, and they've got a law down there. Got 32 tickets for not wearing a seatbelt. A little bit rebellious, uh, so he, he attaches a seatbelt from another vehicle in his car uh, so that it could just hang across, across him like, <laughs> like that, so he didn't get any more tickets. Uh, the problem was he did get, on, get in a head-on collision, and he was killed with his fake seatbelt on. Uh, the writer of the article said, when truly tested, what is fake will fail you. 
And so there's a real concern for, again, holding to the inerrancy of Scripture, to the identity of Jesus Christ uh, as our only Lord and only Savior. So he will confirm his identity with one final sign, death and resurrection. He cautions the disciples to be on their guard. And then thirdly, Jesus confronts the disciples concerning his identity. And we see that in verses 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, or Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah or the Christ. So again, he, in a, a very Gentile area, the region of Caesarea Philippi, it's about 120 miles north of of Jerusalem. Here's a, a picture of the area that Jesus was in. If you go to Israel, this would be one of the sites you go to. And again, that, that cave that you see uh, was part of uh, uh, a whole center of occultic uh, uh, idolatrous worship. It's called uh, Banias today. That was uh, uh, the Arabs took uh, the old term and Jesus day was Panias or after the god Pan. And uh, and uh, so it was a center for occult uh, uh, worship at that time that Jesus is there. And going to the next slide. Uh, but it is a beautiful area as well. It's the heads, one of the head springs of the Jordan River. Even today, you can take your water bottle and just uh, re refill there without repercussion. It's even uh, cold water. Uh, and then the next slide. Uh, but see these little crypts that are carved in the wall. Those were there during the day of Jesus. And of course, there would have been, there's many of them. There would have been uh, idols in uh, each one of them. There's inscriptions, so they know what idol was there and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. But uh, again, it's interesting that Jesus goes to this place to, again, confront his identity and certainly he's going to, uh, to make reference to the, uh, the gates of hell not being able to prevail against the church. We'll talk about that uh, meaning and that he is the Messiah. Uh, he is the one, the savior of the world. And it's interesting that he does it in contrast uh, to what uh, is right behind him. And it's also pertinent to uh, one of the statements he makes to, to Peter. So first, let's look at the fact that Jesus confronts them in order to establish his identity. He does that by asking two questions. Who do the crowds say that I am? And uh, again, a variety of responses there. Everybody realizes there's something supernatural about Jesus. He's got to be one of the prophets. It, it, uh, all these that are mentioned either through scripture or Jewish mythology, have a tie of being the forerunner of the Messiah. So a lot of the people believe that even if he's not the Messiah, he certainly is the forerunner of the Messiah, the messianic kingdom, the kingdom is coming, uh, God's doing something. We haven't heard from God in 400 years, and now we've got John the Baptist, now we've got Jesus, there's something going on here. But then he says... Um, uh, to them, uh, who do you say that I am? So he makes it very personal at, uh, at this point. Uh, he's asking them to make some kind of personal commitment. Now, kind of think it through a little bit. I mean, they've been with Jesus for a while. They've seen all of the miracles. They've heard all of the teaching, the Sermon on the Mount and so forth. They've watched him deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They watched him multiply the loaves and so on and so forth. I think that pretty much they, they would think that you've got it figured out that you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a confrontation here. But who do you say that I am? Who are you really convinced of? Uh, and the way it's, uh, it's phrased much better uh, in a New King James, we kind of lose it a little bit here uh, in the NIV. In the New King James, it says, uh, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he's, he's saying, I'm the Messiah. Is that what you think personally? Where, where's your commitment level at this point? So there's a, there's a bit of a, you know, he's getting ready to, lay, to drop the bombshell. We'll get to that next week. He's about ready to tell him that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer and die and be and, and raised from the dead. And of course, you know, 
it says he begins to teach them that. He's going to have to tell them that over and over. And they still don't seem to really get that. And certainly Peter's the first one that jumps in and says, surely not, Lord, we won't let that happen and, uh, and so forth. So there's a, a confrontation going on that I think the Lord still confronts everybody with at a point in time. Yeah, what have you heard? What do you think? What do you believe? Are you ready to make a commitment to me right now? If you are, I'm getting ready to tell you what the cost of discipleship really is, what the conditions of discipleship really are. Are you ready to pick up your cross and follow me? That's where all of this is going that we'll get to next week, but very confrontational. Again, the Messiah had three roles or functions uh, in their uh, Jewish uh, frame of mind. He would be the prophet who would bring the full and the final revelation of God. He would be the priest who would be the ultimate mediator between God and man. And he would be the king who would rule and reign as the absolute monarch. We talked a little bit about that uh, on Wednesday nights going through the, the Psalms. Living under a Roman rule and oppression, they were a little more focused on the king thing <laughs> than they was the, the, the idea of a mediator uh, and, uh, and the ultimate fulfillment and revelation of, uh, of God. Their response is, is critical. And uh, we look at Peter's uh, response here. Not, not the result, apparently, of his own investigation, uh, but really by the grace of God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Living God, again, an Old Testament terminology they would all be familiar with. And uh, again, very interesting, Jesus says to him, uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. I wonder if Peter said, I knew that. <laughs> if he didn't say it, he probably was tempted to. Uh, interesting, you know, that, uh, you know, this big revelation, right? And, uh, and Peter is absolutely unaware. And so are we so often. God speaks to our hearts, puts words in our mouth to share to edify, to build up, to encourage. It's totally from the Lord. We're totally unaware. I mean, somebody might say, oh man, I needed to hear that. That was from the Lord. And we're like Peter. I knew that. <laughs> we really don't know that. Uh, but God does. God does speak through us and uh, speak to our hearts and, and uh, uses us to convey his love and his grace and his forgiveness and, uh, and so forth to minister to people. And sometimes we're so uh, unaware of uh, really what's going on and what's, uh, what's transpiring. But I love the fact that, uh, you know, often it is confirmed. You know, I mean, we don't have Jesus walking up to us and saying, hey, way to go. You know, that was, uh, that was divine revelation you just had. But at the same time, I remember so often as a young believer, you know, just uh, thinking that uh, uh, that choice of vocabulary, that sounds really weird to me. I think I'm going to start dropping some of those words that I'm used to using. It just doesn't sit right with me anymore. I'm going to, things are changing here. That sounds really strange. I can't believe I said those words all the time. Wow, what an embarrassment when I say that word again. And then I realized that uh, uh, things that I used to do, uh, they begin to bother me. I'm thinking, I don't think that's really a good thing to be doing. I don't think that's really a right thing to be doing. I think I'm going to stop doing that now that I'm a Christian. I didn't read it in the Bible anywhere. No one told me. It just, it just seemed to make sense to me. And then I would start reading the New Testament and go, hey, hey, there it is right there. Hey, I'm on to something here. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to be my father, which is in heaven. God does speak to our hearts. We're, we're so unaware sometimes, but it's cool to read the Bible and have that confirmation and go, yes, that was the word of God. God is speaking to my, to my heart. You know, I, I appreciate it when people, you know, tell me, well, the Lord is leading me to do this and the Lord spoke to me. I just don't get that. You know, I'm more like Jeremiah the prophet, you know, Jeremiah the prophet, you know, he's, uh, he, 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 he thinks God is leading him to buy the field to Anatoth, but everybody's hitting the road. You know, they, uh, you know, they're all getting up in Babylon and who, why would he buy that field from one of his relatives? But he's th he's thinking, he's not sure, but he's thinking the Lord is leading him to do that. And then his cousin or somebody shows up, remembers that, Hey, how would you like to buy the field at Anatoth? Well, okay. So then he buys it and uh, it all comes to pass. And then he goes, and then I knew that it was the Lord. You know, a lot of times it's, it's, it's like that. You know, I'm, I, I feel like the Lord's leading me in this to do this. And then in the end, it works out and you go, well, praise the Lord. That, that was the Lord. 
you know. And there's just so often, even like Peter, where God really is leading us and speaking to us. It's nice to have the confirmation from the word of God. Or even somebody else to say, wow, I needed to, <laughs> that was the Lord because I really needed to hear that. We're so unaware sometimes. Again, so important this confession though for Peter and for them because of what Jesus was about ready to say to them. Nathaniel had already confessed Christ as the son of God in, in John chapter one. The disciples declared him to be God's son after he stilled the storm. Peter had made a confession of faith uh, after Jesus gave the sermon on the bread of life and said, tr you know, again, truly you are the son of God. But uh, what made this confession different is Jesus was explicitly asking for it. And uh, as he does all of us at a, at a point in time, we need to confess Jesus and his identity. Secondly, Jesus confirms Peter's confession as being accurate. And there's six things that, uh, that he then teaches based on the confession and the remarks that he makes about it. And uh, very important uh, to go through these things a, a bit. Verse 18, again, it says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What I want to go through is, is go through six aspects of, this, uh, of these verses of this statement. And try to help us see literally what Jesus is saying here, not what we heard somebody else say some other time. Uh, the first thing is uh, this idea of the foundation of the church being Jesus Christ. If you just read it in the English, it sure sounds like Peter is going to be the foundation of the church. That's just what it says in English, uh, that you're Peter and, is, you know, upon this, I'm going to build the, uh, this rock, I'm going to build the church. And of course, Peter's like, all right, Rocky, you know. But uh, again, in the, uh, in the Greek, it's you are Petros, a little stone, a pebble, I don't, it probably didn't go over real big. Uh, what we do know about Peter is that he was a huge guy. He was super strong, big guy, big fisherman. That was his nickname, the big fisherman. So from now on, I'm giving you a new name. All right, what's my new name? Pebble. Okay, Pebbles. Okay, what else? Uh, so uh, Peter is Pebbles. Uh, and upon this rock, Petra, which means a large rock, as in the base of Mount Hermon where they're standing. Uh, Peter, you're pebbles, but upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, which then begs the question then, what is the, what is the rock? Well, it's certainly not Peter. There's only one other answer, and that is Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, uh, the son of the living God. And again, uh, Roman Catholicism, reading that in English, and you could understand it if you only had it in English, believe that Peter was the foundation of the church, uh, because and Jesus is about ready to say and give him the keys of the kingdom uh, of heaven and give him spiritual authority. Uh, and therefore, Roman Catholicism teaches that uh, that is a foundation of the church. Peter eventually goes to the Rome and then he gives that uh, authority to the next generation, to the next generation. And you have this uh, being passed down from one pope to the next pope and so forth. Uh, anyway, this is the passage where that teaching uh, erroneously comes from. Again, it's not a new concept. Uh, it was declared throughout the Old Testament. I've given you a lot of references. One of them is Psalm 118. Uh, let me read Isaiah 28, 16 there, speaking of the Messiah who was to come. See, this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts uh, will never be dismayed. And in case we're not sure if that's really speaking about the Messiah, Paul, uh, Paul quotes it and makes reference to it in Romans. And then Peter quotes it again and makes reference in his first epistle and says that it's speaking about uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus himself in Matthew 21 said that he was the foundation the church was built upon. Uh, and again, preached by Peter and the apostles in Acts 4. And again, stated by Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 3. So pretty, you know, Old Testament view. The Messiah has come. He's the foundation that, the, that uh, uh, this new work of God is going to be built on. Uh, alineated, preached in the book of Acts. Explained in further detail uh, in, the, uh, in the epistles. And there's where we derive doctrine. Did Jesus teach it? Do we see it in the book of Acts? And do we see explanation of it in the epistles? So again, clearly, uh, whatever background you've come from, 
Jesus and his identity is the foundation the church would be built upon. Hang in with me. A little more theology uh, to go through here. The second thing that is important is this is the first mention of the word church. Again, from the Greek word ecclesia, which means, uh, again, called out ones. But it was just a, simply a Greek word. When Paul is, uh, is there in Athens and there's the angry mob in the amphitheater that want to grab him and kill him and so forth, the term for that angry mob is ecclesia. It was just a, a group of people that are called out for a specific purpose. So Jesus really has to take a term and reinvent it. Called out ones, and then he adds, my church, my called out ones. And by doing so, uh, there's a distinction made between the congregation of Israel, who were God's people, and now what Paul would call a mystery now revealed, the church. Mystery, Jews and Gentiles together. That was a real mystery <laughs> in the Old Testament. Now, they believe that, uh, uh, that all of the goim, all of the Gentiles, all the nations, you know, would come to faith and, and worship the Messiah when he rules here on earth. But, but they, they couldn't conceive of this idea, Jews and Gentiles together, a mystery. Here's the first uh, mention uh, of it. The third thing is Jesus says, who will build the church? And on this rock, I will build my church. You know, there's actually seminars that you can go to and the guys teaching them will think that they're teaching you how to build the church. I, again, I think the angels just get a big kick out of us sometimes. Uh, Jesus builds the church. Well, that's important to have uh, steadfast leadership in the church. That's the real secret. Well, no, that's good to have, but that's, if you think your church was built on that, you got a wrong idea. Well, you have to have a dynamic pastor. You know, I'm a tremendous leader, and that's how we've built our church. No, there's churches in Africa have two and three and 4,000 in them, and they don't have a pastor. They're hoping to get one soon, but they don't have one. Jesus builds the church. Uh, it's, it's not a, uh, something man does. Uh, Jesus, according to Jesus, he's, he's the one that builds, uh, uh, builds the church. And I, I appreciate that from, a, uh, from Pastor Chuck. Um, when we go to the uh, conferences there in Costa Mesa, he never introduces the guys uh, that are going to speak as saying, and so-and-so is going to come up and, church, and speak now and, uh, and teach us on this passage. He pastors the church of this many thousands. He's written a number of books. He's written... Because you get that at other denominational settings. The, the, the accolades go, go on and on. I, I, I remember going to some of those kind of conferences and being, is it like kidding or is, wow, they really do this. I didn't know that. Uh, but uh, it's like introducing a secular guy or something. But Chuck just gets up and says, hey, uh, the Lord's hand is on this guy. Really blessing the ministry there. We're thankful for what the Lord's doing. Come on up and share with us a little bit, John or whoever it is. Uh, it's, it's the work of the Lord. It's what God's doing. God's the one that builds the church according to Jesus. The fourth thing, the gates of Hades will not overcome the church. And, uh, and again, just to look at this simply the way that Jesus taught it. I, I've heard it taught in Pentecostal circles and others. That means that we're going to storm the gates of hell. We're going to take the gates of hell. We're going to go, you know, and as though this phrase had something to do with spiritual warfare or prayer or whatever it might be. But it's a very simple statement. What are the, what are the gates of uh, Hades? Well, gates represent in the Bible authority and power. When you, something, a decision was going to be made in a city, it was always in the city gate, which was actually a large room from which you entered the, the city. Uh, there was benches built in. That's where decisions were made. So we're, Gates is talking about authority and power. Hades was a place of death, Sheol in the, in the Hebrew. So uh, again, the power of death would not have relevance over the church. The church of Jesus Christ can't be killed, Jesus says, because of his death and his resurrection. And also just because of his work in the life of believers. There's been attempts. Uh, there, was a, there was a tremendous attempt uh, in Japan at one point in time to, to kill and crucify every Christian in Japan and then close its borders uh, off again. It was a very, a very horrific time which continues to influence its culture today. Because they developed, that emperor, what they called the five families, which meant that, that he would assign five families together. And if anyone in any of those families was a secret Christian and the other ones did not 
you know, let them know about it, and it was found out. Every person in all five families were all executed. They were all martyred. So it, it brings us a little bit of uh, keeping an eye on each other, you know, kind of a thing, which is a very prevalent thing in Japanese culture today, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and, you know, the status symbols and so forth. It continues the influence. Uh, but many other times and periods in history, there's been attempts to annihilate all the Christians. And Jesus says, the power of Hades, of death, will not be relevant to the church. It will survive and fulfill its, uh, its purposes. And again, he just mentioned his own death and resurrection. The fifth thing is that Jesus says he will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the disciple. And again, uh, King James uh, uh, is difficult at times because of the archaic language and some of the uses of the these and the nows and all that. But what it does do for us, and again, if you aren't looking in a Greek Bible, is that it tells you singular and plural. So we know that here he says to Peter, uh, in thee, not thou or they, but thee, and to you, Peter, I give the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, again, so what does that mean? Well, I want to give you a, a couple of views. Uh, and, uh, but I think, uh, again, the idea of keys means authority. You know, if you, uh, if you um, uh, leave something in the church today and you go out and later this afternoon, remember you left your Bible in here, uh, you can just get a key and come on back in because we just pass them out to everybody on the way out. No, we don't do that. <laughs> if you've got a key to get in, it's because you're in a position of authority. We just don't hand them out. A key represents authority. Keys of the kingdom of heaven. It's what opens doors. And for Peter, that's who's being spoken to, he opened the door of the gospel to the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. As he preaches, 3,000 are added to the church. It's Peter uh, that gets the vision from heaven. Uh, don't call unclean what I've called clean. He wasn't talking about food or being kosher, but he was talking about Jews and Gentiles and says, it's okay. These guys are going to show up from the centurion's house. This guy named Cornelius. Go with him. He does, and he preaches the gospel. Peter has the key, and he opens the door of the gospel to the Jews and then later to uh, the Gentiles. I think that's really what's being spoken about here. What is a little more unclear is this idea of binding and, and loosing. Although, again, a familiar phrase to Jews, it means you can permit or you can forbid uh, certain things. And uh, I'll give you a, a couple of views in it. And one of, the, one of the ones that you hear a lot is the idea that, uh, again, this is taken, I think, wrestled out of context, put into a spiritual warfare context. And so, you get people praying, you know, and I bind Satan, and I, you know, and, and I bind him from doing, you know, and you get this thing going on. I don't know if you, pray, if you pray like that, or if you've heard people pray like that, but I don't think it has anything to do with, with the context in which it's getting, given here. It certainly has everything to do with permitting something uh, and not permitting something. That's, uh, that's very, very clear. I think uh, the other couple of views are, are a little more valid. One is the context here is the gospel, the church, the church being built and the foundation of Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And therefore, when we as believers like Peter did in sharing the gospel and opening the door to Jews and opening the door for Gentiles to come to faith in Christ, there are certain things that we can say with real authority. If you have a friend or a family member and they will confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they'll admit that they are sinners and need to be forgiven and ask to be forgiven, then you with authority can permit, in a sense, them to receive Christ and tell them with great authority, your sins are forgiven. God has accepted you. He will accept uh, anyone that comes to him on that kind of a basis. And you can say, and if you, once you've prayed that, uh, you can now receive the Holy Spirit, again, to work in your heart, to conform you to the image of Christ, to lead and guide and direct your life. So that's, that's certainly, I think, is a, a good view as well, that it's really talking about the gospel in context and what we can do in terms of the authority that God gives us. My personal view, I saved that for last, of course, <laughs> is that I think the Bible is a good commentary on the Bible. And two chapters later, Jesus uses the same phrase. And when he uses the exact same phrase, he's talking about church discipline. That's all. He, he says, you know, if somebody sins against you, you should go to them. 
you know, point it out to him and uh, see if you can work it out and he'll repent and forgiveness and so forth. You won't do it, then you take somebody with you. Uh, he still won't do it, then you uh, bring it before the whole church. Uh, still won't do it, then what it, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's talking about church discipline. But it is talking about, again, <clears throat> permitting something, not permitting something else. I think it's in context primarily of church discipline. If you hear somebody pray about binding Satan and so forth, I, you know, I just, I think God understands the intent of our heart uh, sometimes more than anything else. And uh, I just, uh, I, w I, I prefer to pray directly to Jesus and ask him to do those things rather than assuming some authority that maybe he's given me that I don't have. You know, even uh, Michael, when, uh, when he, they were, uh, you know, arguing, basically in conflict over the body of Moses, re remember that. Uh, he says, uh, the Lord rebuke you. And uh, if that was Michael the archangel, I think it's a good example uh, to pray. Rather than play, pray direct direction prayers, telling God what to do, just pray direct prayers <laughs> right to God. I think he's got a pretty good handle on strategy and how to get things done. I know it's helpful. I know sometimes it's helpful to us if we think we got it figured out enough to be able to give God instructions how to do things. Now, Lord, if you come over and you do this, because I met this person, and that person's very evangelistic. So if you'll bring little Susie over here and talk to them, I think, I think, and they, you know, and, we, and we're praying these, I think God understands the intent of our heart, but I think it's enough uh, to pray to the Lord and in, in, uh, in the authority that he's given us and in the name of Jesus. The sixth thing, uh, Jesus warns the disciples not to tell anyone about this confession. Verse 21, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. It's a military term. He's given a clear order. And it's because, again, it's just not, not the timing. It's not yet. And he has not yet told them, but he's getting ready to talk about his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and what's going to be happening at Jerusalem. And he's about ready to tell them, uh, here's the cost of following me. Are you willing to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me? And as Luke adds, daily. And he's about ready to say that, uh, uh, you know, what profit of man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul. So he's really starting to lay out the cost and the conditions of discipleship. That's what we're going to look at next week. But for the time being, he's saying, my time has not yet come. Don't tell anyone this and this conversation. You know, there, it's for a time yet, uh, yet future. But uh, again, Peter's confession was true and it really is everything. First John, John who was there listening to all of this says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life and he who does not have the son of God does not have life. The identity of the Messiah is everything. It is the foundation on which the church is built. There's going to be one last sign from heaven and one only, and it's death and resurrection, the sign of Jonah. Oh, 